I'm going to just make a couple of points, a couple of comments of some research questions and some research ideas that I think that we're learning in Georgia as we take things up to scale. Uh, I'm going to primarily talk about our Georgia's pre-K program. In Georgia, we actually have two departments of education. We have the Department of Education that serves K through 12, and then we also have the Department of Early Education, which is our services zero to five. And that includes child care licensing, the child care and adult food care program, our quality initiatives, now it includes subsidy, and then our Georgia's pre-K program as, as well. For those of you that don't know, Georgia's Pre-K is a fairly large program. It is statewide. It is universal, which means it's not dependent on a child's family income level. This year, I think we have 84,000 slots in Georgia Pre-K across all counties in both public schools and private child care centers. And I think, Susan, what are we at about 97% uh, capable with those with those numbers. Uh, I do have to say that we must be doing something right in Georgia because when the president decided to <laughs> announce his uh, preschool initiative, he came to our wonderful red state uh, in Atlanta and, and announced that initiative. And even though I'm somewhat of a cynic by nature, I have to say the excitement in our office as we learned that he was coming and we got ready for the visit and everything was wonderful. And it, and it really reminded me that when things are good for kids, they can cross those party and partisan lines. So anyway, it was a good, it was a good week for us in, in Georgia. With regards to scaling up, uh, about a couple of years ago, we implemented the, started using the class. And when I think of the ways that we use that, I think in two different buckets. One is as an observational tool, and for that we truly have gone statewide, which means that all of our field staff in Georgia have been trained on using the, on using the class. Now, we've been very fortunate. We were very methodical in our approach to using the class. It is not used as an accountability measure. It is used primarily as an observational measure where we provide feedback to the, to the teacher. Uh, interestingly, though, because we've been able to do that, we have a lot of data. We have been able to observe most of our pre-K teachers in the past couple of years. I say most because we have had some turnover as some of the budget cuts have filtered down to the, to the classroom level. And we've also been able to conduct some outside research. We just finished the first year of a longitudinal study conducted by the University of North Carolina. Dr. Ellen Peisner Feinberg is the lead researcher there. And then we're also involved in a K through 12 race to the top initiative that includes class professional development. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. But what we had last year then were three different groups of observers that were out doing class observations within our pre-K program. We talk a lot about inter-rater reliability between consultants, but what we're finding in Georgia is there's also an issue of reliability between groups of observers. And so here you had three different observers, all doing pretty much a good representative sample of the state. One, I can say with 100% confidence, was a representative sample, but the other two pretty close, and yet we find some concrete differences between those three groups. So I think as a research community, that's something that we have to address. We have done everything right in Georgia when it comes to reliability between all of our field staff, but yet we still see these differences between groups. When you're using an instrument such as this for accountability, which we're not with the class in Georgia, those differences can be meaningful. And there was a spread of about one point in our instructional support between one group of observers and another group of observers. So I think that's just an important research piece to, to consider. The other thing that I'll comment on in looking at the class as an observational tool is we have seen over time with our field staff to be, they are really infused with class culture. And so when they're going out and they're talking to teachers and they're talking amongst themselves and they're talking at staff meetings, we, get, we have really seen over time this movement towards a, a class culture, but I don't have a way to quantify that. And I would love to be able to share that and show some good numbers and some, and some good slides related to that. I know it's there. I'm just not quite sure yet how to put it in a quantifiable form. So that's just something else to consider. The other piece in going to scale is with professional development. And that's been a little bit different as we look at what we've done in Georgia. As I mentioned, we were very fortunate and that we're part of Georgia's K through 12 race to the top, not the early learning race to the top, but the K through 12 race to the top. And so we have an initiative there that is based on the class with our pre-K teachers. We're in our second year. 
in the first year we were able to assign randomly and just like Jason talked about we did it at the site level too but four different groups of teachers so we have 50 teachers in my teaching partner 50 teachers in a course I don't know if it's the same course that you talked about but making the most of classroom interactions we have a two-day course and then an online course 50 teachers in each and so we were able to do pre and post with them and then measure those changes we are now in year two of that, and so we've increased the numbers in both MTP and MMCI. And then this year, we actually, based on the results from the first year, we instituted a pure control group. But what we found, and this hasn't been published yet because we're waiting till, till we get more numbers from years two and years three with this, is that we didn't see the impacts that we thought we would see with this initiative. Different than what Jason talked about, we saw the significance with emotional support related to my teaching partner somewhat related to the course but very very small effects we didn't see impacts related to classroom organization with MMCI with the course tiny tiny with my teaching partner and we didn't see any impacts with instructional support now we did have very high pretest when it comes to instructional support and that's going back to that group that I mentioned those three different groups at the beginning but we didn't see those impacts what we need in Georgia is a professional development model that we can scale up. We know that we can't do my teaching partner with 3,800 teachers each year. We just know that's not feasible from both a cost standpoint and from a person power standpoint. But we know that there's, you know, our coaches and our, it, I should have said, our, it's our field staff that are the coaches that we have made some, you know, we know they're doing really good things out there, but we're just not seeing those measurable impacts in, uh, in those scores. So that's just something as we move forward to, to consider and what do we look at in years two and three. And then the last thing I'll say real quick, I know my time is up, is that in Georgia we have instituted a quality rated and improvement system, having really strong participation in the first year, but we are using the environment rating scales in our QRIS. What we're finding is for those teachers who are both in pre-K and in quality rated, they're getting technical assistance with a class lens and an ERS lens. And so you can imagine that's not, I mean, for us, it's a very interesting research question. For some of those teachers, they feel like it's a little bit, they're, they're getting very mixed messages. So how do we quantify that? And what are some research ways that we can look at that? Because we know that we have this natural implementation going. All right, thank you.